good health and welcome to today's edition of About Health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Noor. Today we're going to probably focus uh, a, a lot of attention on allergic diseases. Um, we think that this is a good time to talk about them. We will certainly have, uh, plan to have an allergist on the, later in the month, but I'm an allergist and we've been getting a lot of requests for um, uh, for uh, some allergy advice. So I thought we could kind of stop get that, get that, but we can talk about anything you want today. We haven't done that in a while, and I thought that would be a good idea. We're planning an interview with uh, Supervisor Keith Carson on uh, a very special program that he's uh, planning, special forum. And as soon as we can get in touch with him, then uh, we'll be able to um, we'll be able to to talk about that particular program. But mm, right now, first, let me thank so many of you who were able to come out to hear uh, Mar- Dr. Mario Martinez. Uh, he was uh, he was sensational, and you were sensational in attending these events. His book. Um, uh, is the mind body code an excellent um, uh, review of biocognitive data which talks about how our uh, attitudes impact and affect our um, abilities to um to uh fight disease and to promote wellness i think uh, we'll we certainly plan to have him on again and to focus him on um focusing on what he's talking about uh, in relationship to that in addition, um, I'm very happy to have met many of you who I'm not, who I've talked to for many years but have not seen. So that was a really a very good event and we hope to participate or be invited to participate in more events which may, which amplify your health issues. All right. So let's talk a little bit about allergy. You know, this is allergy season. Those of you who've got, you know, some problems with hay fever or asthma or anything like that, this is a good time for us to talk about it. Um, you know, allergy season is very funny. It's different in different time frames. It's different uh, during different years. And this is a year with no rain. And, you know, pollen is pretty smart. Pollen will um, pollen will allow you to, um, uh, you know, to, to stay well for a minute. And then just when you think you've got the season conquered, it recognizes that it's time to get busy and you start to have a number of problems. There's several very distinct seasons here. Uh, obviously, we don't have um, we don't have as much in the way of um, the same commonality with the East Coast. We don't have uh, as many trees uh, of the same type that they have, so we have a different kind of tree season. And the tree season tends to start the whole process of allergy. Usually, when you see those yellow trees out there, though, that's kind of the signal that the allergy season is about to begin. Uh, and so, in, under those circumstances, then uh, then you, the rest of the trees kind of follow that. And as you see the, the trees flower, then you can um, then you can uh, you know follow through and uh, recognize that the season is about to start. Uh, once the season starts with the trees and subsequent to that, you know, the grass start pollen starts and you can tell when the grass pollen starts with um with um uh with the uh looking at the hillsides. Once those hillsides start to turn brown around the edges or brown in the middle, you know that the grass season has started. It usually starts about the first or second week in April. I think maybe some of it's already started. Although we're still pretty much in tree season, so if you see that, that promotes a problem. So if you want to talk about allergy, you got an allergy problem, 8484425 in the 510 area code. But because we haven't done something like this in a while, I mean, if you've got any questions that lingered over the last few minutes, you've got a problem or you uh, you have a problem uh, with some uh, one of your friends or loved ones or your children, you want to talk about um, the issues, specific medical issues, this would be a good time to call us at 848-4425 or 1-800-958-9008. Uh, oh, eight, let me give that number again, um, 848-4425 in the 510 area code. Or one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. So let's talk a little allergy. Let's talk a little bit. If you want, if you've seen, uh, if you've seen Doctor Martinez, you want some clarification on how I understand what he says. That that's a good thing. So give us a call eight four eight four four two five or one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. A good time for us to um, to answer your questions uh, regarding any of the things that you are concerned about uh, at the present time. 
Uh, some interesting articles that we've come across in the uh, last few um, uh, few weeks while we wait for you to uh, call us. Uh, one of the things is that um, that uh, we continue to talk about um, uh, this whole issue of coffee. Now, you know, I've seen five, every time I see a good article about coffee, I see a bad article about coffee. But so I, I'm not sure what to believe. I do know that under g- most circumstances that um, that um, co- coffee has been thought to be pretty good for you. Four or five cups from the last study I saw suggested um, have less uh, certain types of diseases. And just after I've kind of gone through the whole thing with coffee being good for you, uh, here comes an article that talks about higher coffee consumption uh, and that, that may protect against liver cancer. So that means that uh, we got another piece of, of information to suggest that maybe coffee is a is a pretty good thing. I happen to sometimes to believe that some of these things get positive um, uh, uh, studies because that's what people want to hear. Uh, but here again, it's good to know that at least it's not harmful, uh, certainly if taken uh, discreetly. Um, there are uh, several articles about the um, the use of uh, preparations for the treatment of um, high cholesterol. Many of you are on statins, um, uh, you know, and I think that um, that uh, many of you are concerned about the use of statins. I happen to err on the side that that the use of statins is um, uh, can be helpful. That bringing your cholesterol down by exercise and diet is preferable. Uh, and if you haven't tried that and your cholesterol is not in a dangerous area, then I think that that should be the first step in the treatment of high cholesterol. Uh, another interesting article, and maybe you can weigh in on this, is that there's an article on supplements that was, um, that was released by the FDA. And I'm not going to be specific, but, but many issues that relate to supplements um, are somewhat disappointing. One of the major supplements uh, for for li- long life uh, turned out uh, after it being analyzed by the FDA to only contain garlic and rice. Another popular supplement sold by a big giant store. Uh, it's one of its number one sellers for memory. Um, it turns out to contain uh, house plants and um, and. Uh, garlic, uh, that seems to be a popular component, uh, and another substance. So, and then there's several substance supplements that they looked at where the herb that was advertised on the supplement, not only was it not present in the supplement, and this is, these are big chains. These are not little isolated stores. The, uh, the herb not, that, um, that was publicized on the supplement was not there, and they used as a filler uh, legumes, which for many instances related to peanuts and other things, can cause a lot of allergy problems. So if you're gonna if you're gonna use supplements, you need to know what you're doing. You need to have get some advice from um, from uh, some people who are knowledgeable people, uh, and you need to make certain that you're purchasing your supplements from knowledgeable stores. So I think that that's another good piece uh, of information. Uh, and I think that I've always felt that a non-traditional uh, treatments like supplements would be subjected to the same science as supplements, so I'm not surprised. So eight four eight four four two five is our number in the five one zero area code one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. That'll give us a chance to uh, talk to you about some of the issues that you have um, been concerned about over the last few months. If you've got a problem, you you like say I'm, uh, once again I'm not the smartest physician in the world, but I know a lot of them, and maybe we can give you some guidance. So take advantage of this. This KPFA is about the only one that allows you, not allows you, that, that encourages you uh, to share some of your ideas and interests on, around health uh, in a very public way. Let's start with Lisa. You're on about health. Hi, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask about um, allergy immunotherapy. Right. Um, you're an allergist, right? And I'm right. wondering, A, if you do it, and B, mm-hmm. if um, you think it's effective. My mother did it, and it worked for her. I know it's not completely effective. There's people who it works for. And also whether um, I see sublingual immunotherapy is something that's used a lot in Europe but hasn't been approved here by the FDA, I think. Right. And secondly, yeah, so that, yeah, so that was my main question. 
Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, say on the line. I think that whenever you approach an allergy problem and you've identified that a person has a clinical problem which is relevant to allergy, and that uh, that there are positive reactions that you can demonstrate, um, then you have three approaches. One is environmental controls is one of those approaches, and that's what we prefer. If we can identify an allergen that has um, that has um, uh, you know can be can contain like house dust or dog or cat then I think that you can make some modifications. And that's what we would really prefer is the first line of treatment. Then there are the medications for the kinds of symptoms that people have in relationship to allergy, and I think that that uh, often can be sufficient to handle short-term allergy problems and to handle problems with, um, with you know, that are not so uh, so intense, and finally, the final uh, the final problem is allergy immunotherapy. Now, immunotherapy is based upon the concept that you can give an allergen specific for that patient to the point where they make a different kind of response than the one that leads to allergy. It's effective uh, under certain circumstances. It's effective for people who have a clinical problem with allergy, whose skin test and reactivity correlate with that clinical problem in human environmental controls, and medical therapy have not been successful in reversing that particular kind of problem. And so under those circumstances, then um, then immunotherapy must could be considered. And it's considered for only certain allergens, it's good for grasses, trees, and weeds, house dust, animals, and mold. It is not good for food. It is not good for uh, most um, uh, of the type of insects that people get bitten by, but it is very good and even life-saving for the family of insects called Hymenoptera, which is bees, wasps, yellow jackets, hornets, and ants. Now, you're right. Uh, in most of Europe, uh, people are using what we call oral sublingual immunotherapy. And by using oral sublingual immunotherapy, that means that you can give yourself a tablet and that tablet goes underneath the tongue, and gradually over a period of time, you can amass some of the same benefits as with these with the kinds of allergy shots that we're giving now. In Europe, it is really quite popular for a number of different allergens, but in this country, um, we we just, uh, the FDA has decided to approve these things allergen by allergen. So now the only allergen that's really approved for our sublingual immunotherapy is grass. So that grass can so dominate a problem for many people that it's still very useful to have it as as a tool. It comes as a pill form with a prescription. You give yourself the first dose in the doctor's office and then gradually uh, give yourself subsequent doses over the next 11 weeks prior to the grass season. We're almost at the limit of the time when the, when the immunotherapy would probably work. Uh, some people are using sustained immunotherapy of a sublingual type, and I'm certain over the next several years, then you will have enough uh, a, a number of people, a number of different antigens that we can use with sublingual immunotherapy. I think it's a very, very good um, addition uh, to the kinds of things that we have in our armamentarium uh, for allergy, and I think replacing it, uh, sublingual immunotherapy, with uh, the allergy shots that we now give is not uh, is not necessarily unlikely, but maybe probably uh, more likely. So thank you for that question on immunotherapy. So if you've got other questions about allergy, your own allergies, sinus, hay right. fever problems. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Do you have other? Do you have another question? Yes. I just had, okay, so a follow-up to that. Um, so as I have been tested by you for allergies, and I came up negative. Right. However, since then. I've gotten really bad allergy reactions. I'm, I realize people get allergies later. I also understand that with climate change right. and the number of male trees that have been planted, that allergies are skyrocketing. Right. And so I'm wondering, uh, but I am wondering also whether um, people, when they do test for allergies, now that there's such a prevalent amount, of, do they all come up positive? Is there, is, is, or is it possible that you could have allergy reactions even though you come up? negative on those skin tests? There, it is possible that you can have allergy reactions even though you, you come up negative on the skin test because we don't test for everything. Okay. Uh, what we test for are the more common things. The other thing that happens, and it's so often, it, it, and I have to face this as an allergist, because when people, you know, when people such as yourself have a good cause and effect relationship between what you ingest and the kinds of symptoms that you have and the tests come up negative, then there's, there, you have to think of, of other things. Often we can, we get, uh, we, we will sometimes in those instances get a blood test to be sure we haven't missed anything. 
But a lot of other diseases such as bronchitis can simulate asthma. Uh, things like chronic sinus disease can simulate allergic rhinitis or allergic diseases. And so that uh, there are other things that you could still have. That you, people, For instance, let's say with food, people are always concerned, or in many instances are concerned about food allergy. But uh, food sensitivity is probably more common, and the symptoms are almost indistinguishable. Because so that under those circumstances, then um, then um, you know that's a um, that's a, a possibility that there is something else going on which simulates allergy. Probably the easiest thing to always do in situations like that is to um, is to is to try and keep a diary yourself about cause and effect relationships, um, uh, and that will tell you a lot more about your your clinical problem than um, than the testing. But uh, but you might answer, but certainly things can change, and so another set of tests might be warranted. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Lisa, for that. 848-4425 in the 51 area code, 1-800-958-9008. I'm, I'm kind of getting warmed up here now. I was a little lethargic starting this program. I don't know why, but I guess because I expected to speak to uh, to, a, uh, to a live individual, so I wasn't quite prepared to, um, to carry the load here. But, look, I'm more than capable. So all I need is your help. If you've got problems and you want to make a statement, the House Affordable Care Act working for you, uh, anything that you want to talk, health policy, single payer, I'm thinking of all of the things that have stirred us up in the past, 848-4425 or 1-800-958-9008. Let's uh, go to Berkeley and talk to Alan. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I just thought I'd make a comment. Uh, I've had... Nasal allergies for a long time. It's, uh, you know, pollen to do it. And, um, when I was living back in Massachusetts, I came upon a doctor who recommended this stuff for me that works pretty good. I'll just mention the product name. It's called Nasal Crom. Sure. And it, yeah. It's called, it's like a nasal blocker, they call it. And, um, if you just designed to spray it in the morning before you get a reaction, and it sort of, um, it it doesn't get in your bloodstream, but it sort of deadens your sensors in your in your uh, nasal area to reacting so much to the pollens that are floating around. You know, uh, yeah, you know uh, that's uh, it's, nasal cream. It's good you mentioned that. Nasal chrome is one of our most effective um, uh, medicines for allergy. It's one of our oldest too. It, it it actually is what we call a mast cell stabilizer. The mast cell is that cell that causes the problems with allergy, and nasal chrome surrounds that cells and prevents it from releasing uh, chemicals. And um, it it the only problem with it, uh, Alan, is that you have to take it every four to six hours. Uh, because it wears out pretty quickly. But it's one of the most effective, especially for eye symptoms and also for um, for uh, symptoms of e even asthma. It was one of the first real drugs we had that was different from steroids that was effective in asthma. So uh, thank you for mentioning that. And it's, I think it's available across the counter. I don't right. think you have I to have picked, a script. I just picked mine up at one of the big... Uh, drug stores and or shattuck, you know. Right. No, it's it's a nasal chrome is an uh, ideal um, uh, preparation okay. for for allergy. So thanks for mentioning that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Eight four eight four four two five is our number. One eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. If you've got a problem, we're we're, we're looking for uh, questions and uh, and looking for um, uh, contributions to the program, health policy, other things. Uh, this is a good time to call. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention, I guess, since I have not been able, can we try that number again? Uh, uh, one of the things that I haven't mentioned, uh, I mean, that I haven't talked about much over the last few um, things is this whole issue of, um, of beverage, um, the whole beverage issue about um, being able to control the um, the beverages that, that people drink. Uh, I think a lot of studies, I, I thought that the bailout position uh, has always been that okay if you didn't want to drink regular sodas with sugar in them that you could you could drink um, uh, low calorie sodas but what's happened over the last few um, months and, and last few years is that there have been a lot of people who are concerned about uh, the impact of drinking sh uh, sugarless sodas um, a, a I don't think it's necessarily the co uh, components but B uh, is that what it tends to happen and what I've heard happened and and 
we've read from research that we've read is that if you drink uh, sugarless sodas, what it will do is it will increase your um, your desire to eat something sweet later on. And there's been a study recently released that suggests that people are, are much more likely to have belly fat than, uh, without a drinking um, uh, sugar-free sodas than, than regular sodas, or as likely. Uh, that was a little surprising because I, obviously, I, I mean, I would have a, have a personal interest in that because I've always um, had a lot of uh, been, been a person who liked sugarless sodas because I thought they would help to control the diet, and I I like the taste of soda at times, but um, but it does appear that just you don't get any pass uh, from um, from uh, uh, sugarless sodas. So that uh, those of you who are, you know, I think it, I've seen everybody saying, let me get a diet this and a diet that. The diet, the diet this and the diet, the diet that may not be as effective as you think in controlling weight. And I think that really has um, has been a. Uh, 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 enlightening to me because uh, obviously like many of you I thought that um, this would be a way for, for me to help control weight uh, so let's uh, give me the number 848-4425 let us go to Joe and El Cerrito you're on about health oh, hi. I have a recommendation for allergy airborne allergies I used to uh, go to uh, uh, an allergist who uh, gave me needles every, uh, every week or so and then I finally we mailed them to me uh, every couple weeks and he says, try this instead. It's called Bian Pian. It's a Chinese herb. You get it like three and a half bucks for a hundred of them, which costs nothing. And you just, and it's so much easier. And it's just as effective as the needles. It's really good. Okay. He also has something called Breathe Naturally. Go to your Chinese herb store. You'll see. Yeah, okay. Well, good. I mean, there are a lot of tradition, non-traditional ways to treat allergy. I think it's a, it's probably, a, you know, a, a over-the-counter preparations. Of, and the, you know, generally, the health food store pe- people who run these stores are really pretty well versed in how to deal with these um, these kinds of things. And allergy is one of the more common things that can be dealt with in a number of ways. And so I uh, thank you very much um, for that um, that contribution. I think uh, that uh, allergy really requires um, a, a lot of self-analysis. I think that's one of the things and one of the problems that we see with uh, when we see patients with allergy. A lot of the th- problems that we are uh, making, the, you know, diagnosing them, you can you can diagnose yourself simply by keeping an accurate journal of when your symptoms, identifying your symptoms, and keeping uh, an accurate journal of uh, what you are, uh, what symptoms you have in relationship to those allergies. So, uh, good, good contribution, Joe. Thank you very much. Let's now go and talk to Sandra. You're on About Health. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, thank you for all the information. I didn't hear part of it about preparations for allergies, but I guess I can ask somebody who is listening. Uh, I, what my main concern right now is that artificial sugars, which are the diet sugars, such as aspartame, and corn syrup and all those are much more dangerous than cane sugar. And I would very much appreciate everybody researching on that. Uh, the people who, I almost think that the people who got everybody into voting uh, to have uh, soda with cane sugar controlled must be the producers of aspartame, corn syrup, and all of the such. All right, well, good, good contribution. Thank, thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, you know, the uh, I think that's a, that's a good that's that's a good thought. Uh, so uh, let's continue our discussion about um, about some of the things that we know now about uh, allergy and some some of the interesting things that are happening uh, in the field. You know, one of the things that's happening around all these diseases is the whole issue of um, specific therapy for specific people. We're now starting to recognize that uh, you know who you are is a very individual uh, uh, from a therapeutic perspective, and that we can't just start to. Do, in many instances, we're going to stop treating people uh, just based upon the disease itself, and starting to start treating people uh, more nearly based upon the um, the kind of genetic uh, the makeup that they have. Uh, one of the, one of the things that troubles me about that is if you look at uh, some of the things that have happened specifically in. Some 
some of these areas, uh, I think you're starting to see a couple of things happen around the uh, promotion of uh, medications. One is that some of the common medications, especially medications that you need for um, you need for um, uh, treatments of serious diseases like cancer and other things. Some of those uh, preparations are in short supply now because um, the uh, the the manufacturers are saying they're too expensive to make. Uh, and I think one of the unique problems with pharmaceuticals in this country now is that, you know, we are charged in America, so in the United States, so much more than other countries are charged for so many of these preparations because the other countries really can't afford the, the cost of what it takes to um, to do the R&D and the research and development on these um on these particular drugs so that what you're seeing now is that even some of the more common cancer drugs drugs that we've used for years and years are in relatively short supply the other thing is that some of the drugs uh, that, are, that we're starting to see for let's say the condition hepatitis C the original thinking was that the hepatitis C treatments would cost $84,000 and when you consider all the people that are, that are around with hepatitis C who either know they have it or don't know that they have it then that's an awful lot of people who uh, could potentially get a life-saving treatment but who um who uh have not um not you know uh, probably can't won't be able to afford it and i'm looking at the development of a lot of other um you know medical uh, um uh, uh, therapeutic products uh, and i'm starting to see some of the same cost analysis for instance people who have people who have asthma then they are um they are um, uh, looking in the future to getting drugs specific for their for their disease. I mean, there, t- there tends to be so many other causes uh, of asthma that uh, that you could have to take. Uh, you could take one drug at a time, uh, and each drug uh, specific for the patient is going to cost a lot of money. So I'm kind of concerned about some of those things that are, that are happening um, in relationship to medicines, and I think you should be concerned as well and start to follow this uh, this trend of companies that have stopped making medicines for some of the things that um, you um, you would need on a, a fairly regular basis. Uh, I, I don't know whether we have we tried that number again. Uh, I don't know whether we uh, we can uh, we can continue to delay this discussion, but um, but let's go back and talk uh, again about um, some of the other things that we're um, we're thinking about and we're reading about uh, in the uh, in the in the newspaper. Uh, look at uh, look uh, at some of the things that 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 people can do now for a joint replacement. I, I'm starting to see more and more people um, uh, having joint replacement surgery um, and. One of the things that that comes out of that is that uh, the people who have had poor joints and have had some of the surgery uh, tend to get into uh, better shape after the surgery is over. Uh, I think when you have a a, a bad joint, I guess obviously it hurts and it's difficult for you to... um, to, um, you know, get around, and uh, so sometimes these joint replacement um, um, uh, surgeries have really benefited the patient from an overall physical perspective. I think before you have any joint replacement surgery, you need to exhaust all your other options, making certain that good exercise is um, is uh, you, you, you've tried to change things with uh, a good exercise program that you use some of the options that are available, um, you know, for uh, people with um, with joint disease uh, across the counter, uh, checked with uh, alternative providers, uh, and not just orthopedists, but also with chiropractic and acupuncture and some of the other ways in which you can go about it. But it does appear that once that joint is taken care of, then um, then it's um, it's um, uh, it's, it seems to benefit those people who who have the problem solved by increasing their ability to exercise and get around. Uh, 8484425 in the 510 area code 1-800-958-9008 is our, uh, is our, is our number, 800 number. If you want to join us, um, we have uh, several open lines, uh, for, um, for you. So let's talk for now about this, uh, event that Alameda County Supervisor, uh, Keith Carson is hosting. It's a biannual planning and caring forum.
Uh, we know that today seniors are living a lot longer because of technology and alternative health and increased support services. So, so the supervisor is holding the fifth planning and caring for aged loved ones forum. It's a free event which will offer resources and assistance to seniors, their families and friends that allow seniors to age in place in their own homes. I think um, that, that I think is the trend of the future and, and it's been demonstrated that people who live in their own homes have um, a much better their outcomes. The forum will take place on Saturday, April 4th, 2015, uh, from 8.30 to 2.30 at the Ed Roberts um, campus located at um, 3075 Adeline Street in Berkeley. That's the Ed Roberts um, uh, campus located at 3075 Adeline Street in Berkeley. Uh, uh, The supervisor is concerned that California's elderly population is expected to reach 12.5 million by uh, 2040. Alameda County's uh, current senior population is estimated at over 200,000. And over the next 20 years, the senior population in Alameda County is predicted to grow by almost 23%. The fastest growing segment of this population are those uh, 85 years of age and older. So sooner or later, a time will come when uh, a lot of us face the same problem. And I think most of us would like uh, to remain in our own homes. And certainly that thinks that all of the things that we've talked about on our program over the last few um, months have demonstrated that with some of the technology that's available, that uh, that's uh, certainly entirely possible. But this forum ho- hosted by the uh, Supervisor Planning and Caring for Aged Loved One uh, is a free event. Uh, it's, uh, it will feature lively panel discussions, workshops, and resources to educate relatives and caregivers of older adults about the essential tools necessary in planning for legal responsibilities, housing, health, medical decisions, and for the well-being and safety of aging adults. Um, the forum uh, featured keynote speaker would be Dr. David Lindemann of the Center for Technology and Aging at UC Berkeley. We'll share updates about the newest technology advances in healthcare monitoring and communication that allow seniors to safely age in place. And as I move in that direction, man, I'm glad to hear that that, that is the trend. The opening session uh, will be a discussion on healthy living and self-care and will be facilitated by the Alameda County Public Health Department. Uh, And some healthy cooking demonstrations um, will be planned as well. It's a free event. It's open to everyone. It includes lunch, along with community resource fair with valuable information that attendees can take home and then be- begin the planning process. So pre-registration is encouraged. And for more information, you need to please call Aisha Brown at 510-272-6688. That's 510-272-6688. Six six eight six. The planning and caring form is sponsored by Alameda County Supervisor Keith Carson, Sutter Health, SEIU, uh, Telecare, and and Horizon. So uh, we'll we'll give you the dates and time for that that again. So let's get back to on the phone eight four eight four four two five one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. We've got a lot of open lines here, and I'm I'm kind of filling in some time, but I'm here to provide you with some information. So um, uh, we'd appreciate your phone call eight four eight four four two five one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. Well, what's happened with the Ebola epidemic? That's an, another interesting piece of information. We haven't heard as much about it. I mean, it was really pretty popular when uh, when it looked like it was coming to America, but now uh, it seems to have taken uh, a back seat. Uh, and we know now that there are still countries dealing with it. There was a new, one new Liberia has headed uh, under what they call a good control, but uh, but it seems like um, there was a case last week in Liberia, and uh, several countries like Sierra Leone are still struggling with it. We've got a case back here in the States that came from, um, that's being treated at the NIH, but uh, the epidemic's not over. Uh, there are some there 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 have been several positive um turns on the immunization front uh several vaccines show great promise um uh, for as an immunization uh for Ebola and I think that would be uh ultimately what the solution would look like it's very difficult in many of these countries to prevent the epidemics in the ways that we can do them identifying and isolating them um and so I think that that's uh that's a good thing um and if you can 
um, if you can imagine um, uh, what some of these countries are dealing with, uh, a, a vaccine would be um, a, of tremendous help. So, um, so let's uh, let's um, uh, keep a track of that. Let's uh, encourage um, uh, donations to these countries that need some help. Uh, let's remember that the epidemic is still going on, and because it's not um, it's not in um, uh, in the United States right now, uh, we still need to be a part of the world community and deal with that. Uh, I think now we have Supervisor Keith Carson on the um, on the uh, line. Uh, the Supervisor Carson is, uh, without question, uh, one of the leading uh, uh, political leaders in the area of health and so many other things. He uh, he has certainly had my admiration for all of the things he has done and contributed to over the many years he's been a supervisor. He is one of our most effective leaders uh, in making Alameda County probably uh, among the, the best counties in relationship uh, to health care. We have many, many challenges, and uh, maybe he'll speak to some of those as well. But uh, welcome to our program, Supervisor Carson. Uh, Dr. Lenore, I'm humbled by the, even your introduction. Thank you so much for having me on because you've always been someone I've looked up to. What? Were you busy making laws? Uh, am I what? Were you busy making laws? Just well, we just we just concluded having um, both our uh, lobbyists in Washington D.C. and Sacramento on the line to kind of give us the up to the minute update about uh, what's going on in Washington in terms of legislation and. And on the Senate side and the Assembly side in both houses. So Jeff got off the phone with them, with, with about 15 other people in the room. Well, maybe we could uh, talk somewhat about that. But let's first talk about why you got interested in, uh, obviously this is a very much needed uh, conference. I mean, uh, here again, we interviewed a Dr. Topol a, a few a weeks ago who talks about all the technology that allows us to uh, stay at home and to stay healthy. Uh, and certainly as we get, and I see here in, our, in your study that it's estimated the county population of seniors will grow by 23% over the next few years. And, um, and so certainly something like this is necessary. But what got you interested? Well, we, the county, have the, uh, the statutory responsibility for overseeing the health safety and welfare of all of our 1.6 million uh, citizens that live in the 14 cities in the unincorporated area. And that includes uh, social service and all the things that come with that, which also includes in-home health care for those who are uh, homebound and aging, uh, as well as foster care and all the other things, but in health care, behavioral care, and mental health. And, that, and therefore, we work very closely with the over 60s clinic which kind of focuses in on uh, maturing uh, health needs in, in our county, and you worked very closely with them uh, for so many years as well, as, as well as uh, public safety. And so uh, when you do know that uh, uh, proportionally 23.5% of your p- uh, population in Alameda County uh, is um, approaching the years of 85 years or older, uh, when you when you know that people are living much longer and the baby boomers uh, promise to redefine further what it means to live uh, much longer, when you know that's happening, then you need to address the issues of planning for that uh, and, and figuring out how we're going to care for individuals and families uh, that are falling into that category. And unfortunately, Dr. Lenore, um, we know the government is not planned, the federal government, state government, uh, has not planned for the growing aging population, the infrastructure to address that growing aging population. And so that's why this will be our fourth, our fourth planning and caring event uh, that we're holding this coming Saturday at the Ed Roberts Center uh, starting at 8.30 to 2.30 that will address uh, a lot of the challenges for uh, aging loved ones and the families and the community has to take care of them. Yeah, I think it's really important um, to have a conference like this because, you know, there's so many people out there who are taking care of aging parents who have no clue as to exactly what might be available uh, to to the people that they're caring for. I mean, so many people bring their parents here from out of town and out of the city, and so many people are here, and all of a sudden a parent becomes uh, relatively unable to um, to completely do for themselves that don't know about these services. Well, what we've noticed, and, and especially uh, you being a physician and one who uh, continuously has informed the general public by way not only of the radio shows and, and but you know the the articles you've written, 
you, you know that um, many times, unless you're living uh, directly with an aging loved one, you may not pick up on the fact that they're experiencing dementia. Um, and so if you're visiting once in a while, you just think they're a little forgetful. And so you don't know that until it's full-blown, and then you find out, that, well, how do I deal with dementia and Alzheimer's as it's taking place in my family? You may not be aware of how uh, an aging loved one, a mom, a dad, a grandmother, a significant uh, family member is aging uh, until you find out that they have not made any preparations uh, for aging, uh, meaning uh, long-term care or where's the best place for that or legal issues that uh, affect the properties they own or the debt they have outstanding and the family finds themselves having to deal with that. Uh, you, you're not aware necessarily of an aging loved one that may be challenged, uh, and they're driving every day, uh, but their sight is not what it, what they think it is, and you have to now approach a, an 85, 90 year old uh, loved one and tell them that no, they no longer should be driving. And, and, you know, because people want to be independent since they're living longer, they feel a little healthier and stronger, and think that they are still operating at the age of 65 or or 55 when in fact uh, other people are noticing them do notice these incremental is not major shifts in their lifestyles you know one of the things that, it, that that always seems to intrigue me is that how unprepared families are for uh, anything to happen to a loved one uh, like there's no advanced directive often there's no will there's no trust uh, and then you know then everybody kind of hovers around probated be, it divides families I mean, I've said, I said weddings and funerals in our culture divide families more than anything else I've ever seen now will there be any discussions of those things at this conference well the the way that we have uh, historically hosted it, and we'll be doing it uh, the same uh, this coming Thursday, April the 4th, from 8.30 to 2.30 at the Ed Reb Roberts campus. I think that's a Saturday, right? That's this coming Saturday. Right. It's directly across the street right. from the Ashby BART station, uh -huh. uh, which is uh, wheelchair accessible, and, and, and it's for families. It's for those who are aging, but it's also for families who are having uh, to take care of it. And normally... What we have found, and you know this, Dr. Lenore, is that there normally is only one person or uh, two in a family that step up and say, I'm going to assume the responsibility to take care of my, my aging dad or mom or grandmother. Uh, everybody doesn't do that. They figure they have a busy life and we'll deal with it when it fully full on hits us. But we're going to have workshops, and they're rotating workshops, meaning if you miss one workshop, you can take it uh, in an hour and a half later on housing options. So, we, you know, we're, we're a long-term care places. Where are the housing needs for dealing with people who are aging? And for some people who want to stay in their home, they don't want to dis be displaced from the place that they've been living for 40, 50 years. We, we have experts talking about how you deal with uh, housing issues. The legal issues that you refer to, uh, Dr. Lenore, is critical because all of a sudden now you, you may not have focused in on the debt, the growing debt that may be there or how to deal with dividing uh, properties or uh, assets that might be there. And normally that further divides a family or begins the division of the family process. And you might even find that uh, siblings are now having legal challenges against each other because of properties that might have been acquired by a mom or dad. Yeah, that, 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 I see that all the time. And I think that that's, even though I think this, uh, this conference, uh, appropriately concentrates on uh, how to live well, uh, obviously these how to die well in terms of uh, structure, I think is so often not talked about. Uh, so it must be in our communities. Yeah, it, it is. And also the healthy living. I mean, if you really just think about it, uh, a lot of the people who are living at or below a poverty level uh, may not have uh, healthy uh, habits. And um, even even for seniors, you, you, you really want to focus in on making sure that since they are, in fact, living longer, uh, life expectancy is, in, is increasing 74.1%. Currently, the age is 78 years of age, which is the average age. Women live a little longer than men. You want to make sure that that quality of life that you have is as healthy as it could be. So there's healthy eating. 
And yes, while your show, and I've listened to your show many times, focuses in on healthy uh, eating and healthy uh, exercise and everything, we're actually going to have some experts there to talk about the adjustments that should be made in terms of healthy living, the foods you eat, um, and although those are habits you've had for a long time, how to break those habits or change those habits, and how to deal with uh, exercise for seniors. A lot of times they feel like, you know, I, I can't really get out and exercise, but there are walking uh, things that seniors can do. Uh, there's yoga that they can do that seat for seniors and other things that you can do to make sure your bone mass, as you talk about, and your muscle mass, as you talk about, is as best protected as possible. And then there's financial planning. You know, right, it's right. always food and finance, which right. are really at the center of our existence, right? right. And so for the people, families, as well as the seniors themselves dealing with financial planning, um, there is going to be panels and workshops on that because what I have found uh, through the years we've had it, you know, many people find that now I'm taking care of an aging uh, parent and I'm still having to take care of an, an adult kid living in my home. And so how do I, you know, deal with all of that financial planning and management when I have one on the higher spectrum of life and the one is still developing but living at home and it's still dependent upon some form of subsistence, the monies for me or support for me going forward. And how do you take care of yourself when you have all this pressure and tension on you 24 hours a day trying to take care of people who you love, your your kids and as well as your parents? Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Let, let me shift the conversation just a bit. As an Alameda County Supervisor, you're really responsible for the uh, oversight of Alameda Health Care Services Agency. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. You know, I've always been around the country. I have bragged about... Alameda and San Francisco counties and the way in which they handle public health responsibilities. I mean, I know that um, I know that there are a number of challenges, obviously, uh, in the county, and I know that there are some disparities that need to be dealt with. But I really feel that we are privileged in this area to have the kinds of services available to the public, regardless of their ability to pay uh, in the country. Uh, but one of the thing, most intriguing things to me is, is the, new, uh, the new image of Alameda County uh, Health Services Program. I've been seeing these ads, man, that make me want to go to the emergency room. Uh, I'm talking about the – well, I'm, I mean, but I think that this long overdue. Mm -hmm. I think that w what people tend to believe about county services is that they're somehow they are inferior in quality uh, and uh, insufficient. But what we know, those of us who've always taken care of across the spectrum, patients know that once you start taking care of difficult patients, uh, it makes you a better provider. It makes you a better hospital. It makes you a better uh, system because you have to take care of the most difficult patients in the system. But I'm really intrigued about how, what made you decide to to move this um, this jewel, what I consider jewel of a county service. I mean, even it's not perfect; nothing is perfect. Into the public eye, and what is the intent of the campaign? Well, there's, there's several. Um, to be honest with you, Dr. Lenore, I mean, and you 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 kind of know this because of the health uh, health ethnic health health institute. But uh, five or six years ago, I actually convened a meeting of the CEOs of the hospital hospitals that are in my district, and I happen to have uh, the Sutter Corporation in my district, meaning Alta Bates and Summit. I have Kaiser, which is headquartered in my district for the whole country, actually. Their administrative offices are here, and they were at the meeting, and the CEO, Bernard and uh, Tyson and them, uh, as well as Children's Hospital. Uh, being present, at, at, and then I have Highland Hospital uh, in terms of hospitals in my district. And so five, six years ago when we convened uh, the, the meeting with the CEOs, and it was just before Obamacare started to go into effect, uh, the hospital uh, CEO said at that, at that meeting here at our office that we hosted, uh, well, we're, we're going to be going after any paying source. I mean, we, you know, while we might have said uh, you take care of the public sector over there and we do provide great service. If, uh, if, if we have the best trauma center in, in all of California, and if you live in Piedmont and you are engaged in an automotive accident on the Bay Bridge, which happened, and you're a multi-rich uh, uh, billionaire, you're going to wind up at Highland Hospital. You're not going to wind up with your own physician because they know how to deal uh, with that kind of trauma and emergency. And, and the same thing goes throughout the entire system. But uh, all of these uh, these CEOs at that time said, uh, we're going to be looking around for funding sources and paying sources, and we're going to even come after the poor 
which we don't have normally as our paying source uh, because now under Obamacare there will be some insurance with it, there will be some uh, funding with it, some uh, pay uh, 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 revenue coming from it, and so we're going after everything. And so Highland Hospital, which has been perceived and only as a public hospital, said, well, we need to change our game. And and if you're coming after our, our population and try to woo them over, over at Kaiser and Sutter because of the name and the and the, uh, and the way that people look at uh, the services you provide and uh, compared to us, we need to be competitive. So since we already had a system in place, and what do I mean by that? We have good relationships uh, with our community clinics, Asian Health, uh, Over 60, La Clinica, West Oakland, all of the other. We had an infrastructure there. We have school-based health clinics that are located at Berkeley High and McClymonds and, and Fremont and, and Tech and other places. And, and, and we, we, we had loose affiliations with hospitals throughout the county in terms of San Leandro and Alameda. We actually went out and acquired teams. San Leandro. We went out and acquired uh, uh, Alameda so people could get their hospital uh, specialty care provided right in their own community. And then this uh, network that we had uh, working with the community clinics that were uh, common and friendly to the people coming through their doors who were from those neighborhoods, we said, let's leverage that uh, in terms of the structure and the system that we already had loosely. Let's Let's pick that up a couple of notches. And so now what you're hearing about is really the marketing of that. The service is still there and it's getting better and quicker, uh, but we're marketing more. And we didn't market before because we did, we normally had a dedicated uh, patient base, which was um, the, those who didn't have insurance and those who uh, uh, couldn't afford to go to Kaiser or go to Sutter. Is is there uh, and this is uh, is there a plan uh, in within the county system to incorporate the many physicians who have practiced independent of the county uh, into some some of the systems that the county has? Obviously. Uh, you know, you're familiar with the, with the federally qualified rates that uh, all of us have, those of us who have practiced privately, uh, not privately, but those of us who practice outside the system have had to compete against for a number of years. Uh, as this system evolves, obviously the doctor on the corner will somehow be a thing of the past. But uh, one of the concerns that, that I have, and I, here I'm kind of on the downside of this career, is the preservation of certain types of uh, community physicians who have traditionally serve these patient populations and they're feeling some of the same pressures you talk about. A, they're not always in the networks that need to be established. B, they don't have the federally qualified subsidies that that the community clinics have uh, and C, they provide probably a unique et- services by language and ethnicity uh, to a population that may not want either the Kaiser model or a county model. Well, uh, you, you raise an issue that has been an ongoing uh, discussion uh, all, almost since I've been on the Board of Supervisors, and especially with uh, independent physicians that are out there doing incredible work uh, that are not getting compensated nearly uh, the way that they should be, and especially for others who are associated either with the, cl- with the clinics and or with the hospitals. Uh, I think that um, to, to answer you directly, uh, we're in a new day now in terms of how uh, health care is being provided, especially uh, through Obamacare and and through the re kind of resourcing and how these things are compensated for and paid for, and while there's still some book some rules on the books in terms of how the feds and the, and the state are uh, reimbursing for services, meaning uh, after we paid those uh, provided those services, we send up the bill and then uh, they uh, six months later okay. give us a lump sum to pay for that. I, we're all sitting down now in a new day and saying um, we 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 still got to figure out a way to uh, fairly pay. Uh, uh, the doctors, the community doctors that are independent and, and make them a part of the system. And as we're revisiting and looking at that, um, there's, this is a new day with new, new, new technology and ways we can leverage that technology to work more co- cooperatively and, and seamlessly with independent physicians in terms of billing and all the other things. And, and then we're also seeing and that the network that at least Alameda County has uh, has to go back and look at how do we deal with independent physicians. That, that's been a challenge up to now, to be quite honest with you, because the physician groups uh, have been organized. And in some cases, they've been organized and they uh, are unions. And, and so when we have um, negotiated 
uh, these pays and negotiated these contracts, uh, those were uh, part of the factors that uh, were there to lobby, uh, was more organized physician uh, organizations and unions uh, for those physicians and kind of kept them in place and acted as a bargaining chip. I think that while that still exists, uh, the new day in terms of how you pay and how you can organize is being reevaluated. So you might see some change on that soon. One more, one more question. Um, the the future of San Leandro Hospital. Mm -hmm. Just, you, you, just you a question. San Leandro Hospital. Yes. Yeah, we we acquired San Leandro Hospital on last year. Um, we're still going through uh, major conversion. Uh, we do now own and operate that hospital, and so we are kind of uh, trying to figure out how to make that after we uh, picked it up from Sutter. Uh, that now we have to uh, try to figure out how to make it profitable, but at the same point in time, um, because it wasn't profitable, when uh, not because Sutter was running it, but it was because of um, the payer mix that was there. And so now we're trying to make sure that we improve um, the revenue to that facility while not compromising um, the population is served and how we serve it. And so um, just like Alameda, uh, hospital, uh, San Leandro Hospital is one of those newly acquired for people who are out in South County in the southern area. Keep in mind, we are we are still competing against Kaiser, which is in Hayward, uh, right there near San Leandro. We're still competing against uh, other institutions that are hospital institutions in that area, and so we're trying to find that balance, but uh, and keep the culture, uh, pay uh, fair and decent wages, and still um, be able to uh, make it a profitable venture. Well, Dr. Um, with, with Supervisor Carson, thank you very much for your time. We we probably have a lot of people who would like to talk uh, about other aspects of health in Alameda County and hope that you will consider being a regular guest I'd love uh, to it. talk to those people. And uh, thank you so much for your – you could have moved on. Well, thank, and, and you. thank you. I appreciate all you've always done and continue to do for for this community. Uh, you have a good day, and thank you. thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, we've got time for one more question. Let's go to Karen. You're on About Health. Oh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Lenore. Uh, you know, the H1N1 flu vaccine, yeah. you see it advertised everywhere. You get flyers. It's in the Walgreens. Right. Get your vaccine. It's on a bus. <laughs> get it, get it. It's, every, it's just in your face everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I, try, I did a little research project on my own. I called uh, the um, uh, California Department of Public Health. I called UCSF. I called Kaiser. I called my own physician. I called the pharmacist at Walgreens. I must have made about 40 calls uh -huh. to try to find out where it came from uh, what's in it right where it's made right where it's loaded up in the injection things if it's made in the united states or canada or europe or Ger germany uh -huh. and if it's not made in the united states why can't it be made and i couldn't get one answer nobody knew where it came from and they didn't know where the where the culture was grown that was grown in uh, eggs or petri dishes or what? Nobody knew, not in any health facility. And I just spent an hour listening to your guest, who went on and on and on and on about what a great healthcare system. But nobody in that healthcare no. system can tell you where this vaccine comes from and what's in it. No, you know, that, that we were just talking about a specific element within the whole system. You're talking about this is an indictment of the system itself. Yes, it is. And so, yeah, no. So we were just talking about Alameda County. Okay, well, but, this, is, this is very important because yeah. the people. Are are going to be sold on going to this system or Stanley Under Hospital or Kaiser or wherever, right. and the people that work there, the staff, the doctors, the nurses, and the people that are going to stick a needle in your arm right. don't even know what they're putting into you or where it came from or what's in it, then what does that say? Uh, well, yeah, I think you, your statement speaks for itself. Okay, thank you so much. No, thank you, Karen. Okay, bye-bye. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Karen, for joining us. And thank you for joining us on today's edition of About Health. Thanks to Supervisor Carson. Uh, remember, health is your biggest asset. I'm Dr. Mike Renner. We'll talk again next week. Thank you. Thank you. I'm humbled to receive this honor and be counted among the men and women to be named Nobel laureates. I've traversed a long road to arrive on this Nobel Peace Prize platform, met many challenges, climbed many mountains, but I've had help along the way. I'll never forget my first step on this journey, the KPFA Apprenticeship Program, where I got my chance to learn skills in media and broadcast journalism and gain access to radio as a means to tell my story and foster social change in my community. To the First Voice Apprenticeship Program, I owe a great debt of gratitude. Now's your chance to apply to the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. The application is due April 3rd, 
and you'll find the application online at kpfaapprentice.org. Or you can call 510-848-6767, extension 235. Again, that's 510-848-6767, extension 235. Or online at kpfaapprentice.org. Be sure to catch Apex Express on KPFA. Apex Express is a weekly program following news and cultural events throughout Asia and the Pacific Islands. Find out about issues affecting Asian American and Pacific Islander communities locally and globally. Get on board the Apex Express Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. on KPFA. Hey, what's happening, y'all? This is Jazz Sawyer, and I'm inviting you to join me and the Experience Collective on the Lewis Sawyer Experience, Tuesdays from 5 to 6 a.m., only on KPFA 94.1 FM.